Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this another virtual of United National Congress. We have come to a time where I am watching football on TV, and I see that in the United Kingdom, over 21,000 people attended the stadium to look at the last match. So whilst they are opening their borders and they're opening up their spaces, opening up their businesses, opening up their society, we have gone in the opposite direction. We are now into a state of emergency. How did we get there? I will spend a little time on that later, but I think there are some important issues to be raised. Let me make it very clear at this point in time that the UNC supports initiatives aimed at saving lives and saving livelihoods. We support initiatives to get the virus under control. However, we reserve the right to raise concerns and to keep holding the government to account. We support vaccination as a priority. This is the only real measure that will bring the virus down. So we support vaccination as a priority in the fight against COVID. In this regard, we recommend that you consult your doctor because each person's health is different. And therefore, consult your doctor and make your decision. But vaccination is a priority at this time. We continue to urge government to take all essential steps to get sufficient vaccines for our population. Already we are way under even our own CARICOM partners here in the region in terms of the numbers vaccinated and in terms of percentage of our population. In this regard, in uh, accessing vaccines, I know the Prime Minister threw his hands up in the air when last he spoke about we can't get vaccines, and that has been his cry all along. They're not sufficient vaccines. Well, Prime Minister, pride cometh before the fall. Put your pride away and write to the United States or call upon the United States because the U.S. has now announced, President Biden has announced, that they will be giving away more vaccines. So in addition to those that were announced before, the president is now saying they have more vaccines that they would like to donate. So, Prime Minister, I call upon you, and indeed I take the bold step to ask the United States to please send some vaccines out of this latest batch and the previous batch to Trinidad and Tobago. So we support vaccination. The government has been saying that we are sabotaging the vaccination program. Well, first of all, you don't have a, we are sabotaging the vaccination program. Can you tell us when and where we did that? because that has not happened. The truth is that you do not have sufficient vaccines. The truth is that there are long lines when there were some vaccines that you got from India, which we also lobbied for, which you, I hope, also lobbied for. There were long lines. People were coming together. So it's not that there's a sabotage. It's that you have sabotaged the process because you have not secured the vaccines needed for our population. So please, here is another opportunity. Put your pride aside and ask the U.S., and I also ask the U.S. to please send us some vaccines. So we totally support vaccination at this time. The UNC will continue to hold the government to account for the expenditure of taxpayers' monies. You have spent, you said, $18 billion. We still don't know where this money has gone. We call upon you to explain and show the population where you spend that $18 billion. And further, I call for a full audit of your alleged expenditure on COVID-related matters in dealing with the pandemic, in dealing with our crisis. With the billions spent on COVID, with government's plans to take additional debt, we ask for transparency and accountability in expenditures. So now we have the state of emergency. But you know, the state of emergency affects us in the internal spaces of Trinidad and Tobago. But without dealing with the porous borders, then we are in trouble. Because then the persons who are coming in through, illegally through, not the ports that you've closed down, not the airport that you've closed down, but they're coming through other unprotected areas on our porous borders, in our porous borders. And therefore, the state of emergency, the lockdown, the curfew, and so on, will have little or maybe no effect 
if any at all, unless you deal with the porous borders. You have disclosed no plans as to how we are going to be dealing with the porous borders and the influx of illegals coming into our borders. So, yes, we support your initiatives, but we raise the concerns, and that is one concern. The state of emergency without dealing with the porous borders will yield very little effect. So, on the issue of vaccines, you sat on your hands, you made excuses up to the last time you spoke about the vaccines, that you cannot get the vaccines, but yet you dilly-dallied and shilly-shallied and did not seek to procure vaccines for Trinidad and Tobago. We have pursued the vaccination option from day one, from the very beginning, and we continue to so press for vaccination. As I said before, that is the best way of bringing the vaccine down, bringing the um, COVID, bringing the pandemic, dealing with the crisis at this time. So, again, I said we support initiatives to save lives, to save livelihoods, but at the same time, we reserve the right to raise concerns. And I have some very serious concerns when it comes to the state of emergency regulations which have now been published. First of all, government delayed and was very negligent when they announced the state of emergency on Saturday, failed to say what the regulations were left the nation in chaos and confusion because people didn't know what they were allowed to do or what they were not allowed to do because no regulations were brought forward. 24 hours after the announcement of the state of emergency, no regulations were published. These have now been published. And as I say, I have some concerns with them. And I see clarification because in some respects, there is ambiguity, there is vagueness, and therefore clarity is needed so people can know again what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. And therefore, certainty is very important in lawmaking. Regulations are, in fact, subsidiary legislation. They are, in fact, part now of the law of Trinidad and Tobago. So whilst there may be other concerns with the regulations, I want to raise some of them this evening. And first of all, I want to deal with Regulation 3, which is really the substantive regulation which governs the rest of the regulations. And Regulation 3 deals with, and I will quote it because it's important that we get the wording right. During the period of public emergency, between the hours of 5.01 a.m. to 8.59 p.m. every day, a person shall not gather in any public place unless the gathering, one, for the purpose of services specified in subregulation 10. And two, does not exceed five persons at a time. So first of all, you cannot gather in any public place unless you fall within some of the uh, purposes specified in subregulation 10. I'll come to that. And regulation 3, 1B says, a person shall not be at any workplace unless the services are specified in sub-regulation 10. So there are two parts of it. You cannot gather in a public space, and the second part is that you cannot be at any workplace, again, unless you fall within the exemptions on the sub-regulation 10. So these are the questions which arise, and these are the concerns I have. First of all, are the offices of members of parliament, the offices of councillors, the office of the leader of the opposition, are these offices public places? And the answer is obviously yes. Because the same regulations uh, in legal notice um, 142 of 2021 defines for us what is a public space. Now, it is easy in some senses to know being on a street, being on a highway, that that is a public space. It becomes moot and it becomes a little vague when you start to move into now offices, operating as MPs, operating as councillors, operating as the leader of the opposition at those offices. Are those public spaces? And in my respectful view, based on the definition in Regulation 2, yes, they are public spaces. And therefore, you cannot gather there, no person shall gather there unless you have an exemption, unless you are providing services as in subregulation 10, and I'll come to see what those are. So the first thing is that these are public spaces. Secondly, they are places of work. We have people working in these offices, MPs' offices, councillors' offices, 
at the office of the leader of the opposition. These are places of work and therefore no person shall be there unless you have the exemptions as uh, provided for in Regulation 10. So, public place, Regulation 2 says, a public place means any highway, street, park, etc., etc. And this is important part for the purposes of the concern I'm raising now. Any open or enclosed space to which for the time being the public have or are permitted to have access, whether on payment or otherwise. Yes, persons have access to MP's offices, council's offices, office of the leader of the opposition. But they also have access to political offices. Not just as parliamentarians or councils, but political parties have offices. And the UNC has offices. We have uh, a headquarters, as does other political parties. So all political parties have places of work. Places of work which are also, in my respectful view, public spaces. Because the public can come there. They're permitted to come there. They come to seek advice. They want to make representation. They come to these offices. So first of all, we are saying that these are caught within the regulations and no person shall gather at these spaces. And secondly, no person shall come there as a workplace, so that means for the employees. Now, do you have an exemption under Regulation 10? Regulation 10 provides almost 100 services which could be exempt. One of them speaks to... Um, the Parliament. Subrogation 10 tells us about Parliament. So what does it say when it comes to Parliament? The, during the period of public emergency, this is Regulation 10, and uh, specifically Regulation 10C. The period of public emergency between 5 and 9 every day, the following services may be provided. So you're allowed to do these things. C. Operations and sittings of the Houses of Parliament, meetings of Cabinet, or any committees thereof. So do the offices of MPs, does the office of the leader of the opposition fall within operations and sittings of the Houses of Parliament? In my respectful view, this is uncertain. There is one view that no, the operations at MPs' offices are not operations of the Parliament or the citizens of the Parliament. Indeed, there was a uh, there was a case which um, some of you may remember many years ago when we had the 1818 tie. There was a case of Chandra Sharma and the Attorney General, where as MPs, I was one of those MPs. There were 18 of us who um, brought litigation against the government, claiming that you have to pay us salaries. We were elected MPs of Parliament, but you did not pay us for a whole year whilst the Parliament was in deadlock, whilst the Speaker was uh, elected. Um, on the other hand, the other half of the house, or the other side of the house, the other 18, remember it was 18, 18, they were collecting salaries because they were appointed ministers. And every one of the PNM ministers were appointed ministers, and every PNM center was appointed a minister at that time. So they were collecting salaries. But as the opposition then, UNC MPs, they said, no, we are not paying you because you have not taken the oath of office, and therefore you cannot collect salary. So we went to the, the, the courts. At the law court, the court ruled, no, we were not entitled to be paid. At the court of Wheel and Trinidad, they, they said, no, we were not entitled to be paid. When it went to the Privy Council, the Privy Council said, yes, yes. You can't give half the House, which are the government members, payments, but on the other hand, you're not giving the opposition MPs. And yes, they're entitled to be paid. And the point I want to take out of that case is this, that whilst it is, is to make the distinction between sittings in the parliament and the work done by MPs outside of the parliament. So outside of the parliament, the courts said, listen, even though you are not sitting in the parliament because the parliament is deadlocked, there's no um, speaker and so on, you carry out functions as an MP outside of those sittings and operations of the parliament. You carry out advisory things, you make representations on behalf of your constituents, and therefore you were entitled to be paid. I raise this case today because I'm saying that under Regulation 10C, whilst the sittings of the Parliament and the committees of the Parliament, whilst those are services that are allowed to be carried on, the work that MPs do in their constituencies, 
will not fall under. And if they do, again, clarify. It is uncertain. It is vague. It is ambiguous. So clarify. Make it very explicit. Make it very clear. Expressly provide that MPs, offices, councillors' offices, office of the leader of the opposition, that these offices, as public spaces, yes, but that they can be under an exemption. As it stands, does it fall under 10C, operations and sittings of the houses? I'm saying in one view, the answer is no. And therefore, as MPs, we have an important function outside of the parliament sittings to service our constituents. Councillors also have that same job to do. Office of the leader of the opposition. So these are public spaces, yes. But there is no express provision in the regulations allowing these offices for persons to come because persons do come. They come to all these offices. And this will not affect just the UNC offices, you know. Not only UNC MPs, not only UNC councillors, it also affects the PNM councillors and PNM MPs, their offices, will also be impacted by this. And it is indeed as elected representatives, councillors, and as MPs, we have an important role to play in our representative democracy that if these regulations do not expressly provide for the functions we carry out, or carry out outside of the sittings of the parliament, then we are in a bad place indeed. The democracy demands that these offices be allowed to operate and be given an express provision as being um, allowed, as I say, being not prohibited from the services we provide. So that's the respect of a public space that people can come, albeit it will be five at any one time, following the protocols, but that people should be allowed to come to these offices to seek help, and they're doing that. They're seeking help through the, the electronic, um, the technology, but also people come. There are people who don't have devices. They can't make phone calls. They can't send WhatsApp. They can't send um, emails and so on. That They walk into an office, MP's office, council's office, and so on, office of the leader. I say, listen, I need help. So I'm saying this should be made, should be cleared up. It should be very clear that these offices, people can continue to come. Albeit five at a time, that's okay. But at the same time, people should know for certain I can go to my MP's office. I can go to the councillor's office. I can go to the office of the leader of the opposition. And that, I think, needs clarification. So that is in terms of gathering. But then these offices are also workplaces. And the regulation I read, the three, regulation three, the second part of it said, no person shall be at a workplace. But these are workplaces. There is members of staff in these offices, all three, opposition office, council's offices, and office of the leader of the opposition. So is it that our staff now must stay away? If there's no staff there, how can we carry out our function? We will not be able to do the work. If the staff are not allowed the exemption or not allowed expressly allowed that they can be there at the workplace if they're providing services at these offices. So I'm saying that's one aspect of the regulations that I have a concern with, serious concerns. The second aspect has to do with political offices now. Now, whilst it is the regulations say services provided with respect to operations and sittings of the parliament, and I'm saying I don't think the offices fall under that, they work outside in the offices, and whilst it is for councillors, statutory corporations are exempt under the Regulation 10, one aspect of it. Statutory corporations and the municipal corporations, the local government bodies, they are exempt. But that will be with respect to the work they do in the corporation. When they go to meetings of the corporation, when they have committee meetings of the corporations, the regional corporations, the local government bodies and so on. But are they exempt when they go to the public places, which is the office? Are they exempt when the workers come in? I don't think that it is covered by that limited um, exemption in 10 for statutory authorities and therefore municipal corporations. Let's come to the second aspect now, political offices. All political parties have offices. We have a headquarters, we have other offices in various parts of the country. Other political parties likewise have offices and they are public spaces because people do come. Remember, I read the definition of public space. People come. So first of all, they say you cannot gather unless you have 
some exemption on the regulation 10. Second, you can't go to work. It's a workplace. You can't, no person shall go to this workplace. These are workplaces. So first, they're public spaces, as defined, and they're also workplaces. So we have staff at these offices, all political parties. In the regulation, there is no, in the 10, which is the one giving all the services that can continue, there is nothing allowing political the offices of political parties to provide services, to have people at work, nothing in it whatsoever. And in a participatory democracy, in a democracy representative democracy like ours, this is a vital part of the democracy. The political parties must be allowed to operate, even if it is a limited operation of gathering, at least five, must be allowed to have persons at work, so when public comes in, you can answer their queries, you can help them. They come in, they want help for themselves, for their families. A lot of hardship is going on out there, and they're seeking that assistance. There is nothing, no express provision for political parties to do their work. And I call on government. I don't need clarity for that. I'm certain that this is prohibited. I call on government that they must correct that and allow political parties in the same way they've done it for trade unions. Interesting enough, in the Regulation 10, which gives the services that can continue to be provided, the trade unions are provided for. And that's good. That's important because trade unions are an important part of the democracy. In that, they provide for religious organization, and that's good too. They're saying, well, you will hold services only for weddings and funerals, and numbers are limited. Okay, fine. But you also allow the, the religious organization something else. You said they can, they can meet. They can gather, again, in the small numbers. You can do it if you want to pre-record or you want to do Zoom. So in that way, you still, you still reach your, 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 um, your congregation. But for political parties, we can't even do a Zoom. So today, where we are doing this virtual, I can't be at the party office. If a political party wants to hold a press conference, where will they hold it? We cannot do that from an MP office. We cannot do it from the political office. And they're fighting this is a serious, serious um, lapse or lacuna in the regulations that needs to be corrected, that political parties should be given. And that means the PNM, the UNC, the PDP, and any other party should be given likewise um, uh, permission to carry out services from their political offices. So in terms of the regulations, these are some of the concerns I have. There are other concerns, but I will raise them as we carry on. I call on government to correct what I see as a serious a breach and violation of our democracy as we know it as participatory democracy. And remember, we talk about um, SOEs will curtail your rights, and yes, that is that it may be. And the rights we have under the Constitution include the rights to join political parties. These are enshrined rights. Political parties, the right to express political views, the right to freedom of assembly and association, political parties can meet. That's a serious part of the democracy. But the regulations at the moment do not allow for the services and the work of political parties. I am not asking you to say we can have mass meetings in the public square in Woodford Square or wherever it may be. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying in the same way you've allowed for the trade unions to have the limited gatherings and to carry out their workplaces or their, to carry out their services at their workplaces, in the same way that should also be afforded to political parties. With the regulations again, another concern I have has to do with um, A doctor raised this with me. The doctor says, listen, due to overcrowding on medical institutions, if there is a patient who has to be discharged during curfew hours, can that person leave the healthcare facilities and go home? So if that person is discharged after 9 p.m. in the night, before 5 a.m. in the morning, are you in breach of these regulations? Or where no person in a public place, which is the, the street and the highway, and so can you go home? The doctor is saying, well, those persons, they are not exempted under the regulations. Now, health services are exempted. 
they can continue. But that's not a health service. That's when you leave the health facility, you leave the hospital. So what happens whilst you're on the road? Are you in breach then? As a person, being in a public place, with none of the exempt um, positions applying. So again, the only persons allowed to be out at curfew are those who fall in the services under the Regulation 10. There is nothing for persons like these who may be coming out of a facility. So government seems to be in chaos so that they bring out their hustlers masquerading as independents to do damage control everywhere. But these are serious concerns. I say we'll hold the government account and we'll raise our concerns. There are other concerns. I, I know some of them. People are market vendors. Whilst the Regulation 10 says you could be out for vegetable stores, fruit stores, and so on, I think we need to clarify because the farmers are uncertain, the market vendors are uncertain, because they're saying, look, it's 5 a.m., the curfew ends from 5 to 9, but we have to get out our produce out there before 5 a.m. So when they go to set up in the market and so on, they are out there before the 5 a.m. Now, you may tell me, Regulation 10 says um, there are some exemptions for market stalls and food stalls and so on, but can you clarify and tell these market people, yes, you are okay, you can come out before 5 a.m. to go set up your, um, set up your stalls and so on. So those are some uh, quick uh, points with the regulations. There will be others, but these are the ones I've um, zeroed in, in, in at the moment. And now I want to turn to another issue. The issue has to do with the care at health facilities, medical care. Already we've been told that the facilities are overcrowded. We've been told that the frontline personnel in these institutions, they do not have proper equipment, what you call PPE. They don't have proper enough of it. We've been told that supplies of uh, vital supplies that people will need, ventilators and so on, there's a shortage of these things when people go in. We're also being told that when you go in, that the people at the medical facility, and this is a very serious matter, they are categorizing you. They're categorizing you and say, hey, listen, you all, you have what they call the, the preconditions and so on, so that don't pay too much priority. You know, that person could that person could go. Because you're overcrowded and you're understaffed and so on. You're saying, listen, you come in there, old person, you have heart disease, you have diabetes, whatever it may be, preconditions, what they call comorbidities. And therefore, well, they get it. You shut those aside. Is this true? Is this true? Look, someone sent me this, and I want to read it because it's very heartbreaking. I was told this by people working in the healthcare facilities, and now here is an actual case that someone sent me of where this happened. This man was not a statistic on the internet that you will check at 4.30 p.m., that you have one of the latest numbers contracted or one of the latest deaths. It's not a statistic. It's a real person. This person had his life stolen away from him, on May 14th, 2021. This is what was sent to me. He was 86 years old. That may seem old to some. The quality of life he had, that may seem old, but the quality of life he had was most definitely present and one that anyone who knew him would know it was worth fighting for. Despite being homebound, and I continue to read, for the last year, plus by himself, with far too infrequent visits, he got COVID. That's the thing about this virus. I cannot even be upset with how he got it because the person was none the wiser that they themselves had been exposed. I continue to read. Rewind to all the images of how your small circle connects to one hundredths or more without you realizing. And all those advertisements of staying away from your grandparents and your mother and so on because you love them and you understand what COVID is about. I want to share an experience because we do not know as a nation what is taking place. After struggling at home for a couple of days, even with the generous generosity of getting uh, um, a person who gave them or donated an oxygen concentrator, his oxygen con content was slowly declining. We knew he would not want to leave home 
but we also knew without the right equipment and care, we would not have been able to save him. So our hands tied behind our backs, we called an ambulance, who, mind you, arrived without knowing where they were taking him, since there were no beds available at any of the health centers. The ambulance took four hours to arrive, and the driver spoke of absolute horror on this day, thus far, and the state of the hospitals. Right before driving out of the house, Kova said yes, because remember they're saying they didn't know where to take him. Kova said yes, someone had just died, a bed opened up, bring him immediately. I continue to read, let that soak in, someone just died and a bed opened up. I continue to read, with a grateful heart and filled with hope, we promised him we would bring him back home. If we knew, we promised him, they took him, and we prom they promised him, look, we'll bring you back home. If we knew what would happen next, we would never have sent him. He arrives, and the first phone call from the hospital brought on the grim reality of our decision. Using our government's reporting language, he was an elderly male with comorbidities. So we knew his odds were against him. Your dad is very sick, and because of his age, he does not qualify for ICU. He has a patient that needs the ICU, but he doesn't qualify. You know why? Because he's only going to die anyhow. Isn't that what that implies? Your dad is very sick, and because of his age, he does not qualify for ICU. The system is overrun, and because of the government's profile, he was not a candidate for further treatment. It's not just odds against him. It is a placement of a body in a production line with a predetermined result. This was his death sentence. Cue in guilt and regret for entrusting his care in our government system. Immediately we knew we made the wrong choice. My sweet, and they give the name, died alone and scared on Friday morning at 7.35 a.m. Died at 7.35 a.m. We were contacted at 4.07 p.m. 4.07, so many hours later, over eight hours later. Why am I sharing such a personal story? Because my story is similar to far too many people. One year with this vicious virus blowing up all over the world. One year with our borders closed. One year with minimal impact on our community. What did our government do with their head start? Nothing. As I say, whilst others open, I'm going off the script there, uh, off the quote, whilst other countries are opening up, we are locking down. State of emergency. I continue to read. Medical system never really prepared, prepared sufficiently, despite knowing what would happen with a major spread. The day he was admitted, we had four, 342 in hospital, 340 persons hospital, nine in ICU, and 58 in HDU. A joke I know, but that's our capability. Continue to read. Vaccinations at 60,000 out of 1.4 million, a 4% rate of vaccination. They mindfully kept Trinidad in a bubble, a bubble thin coating of bubble wrap, but did nothing to protect us. It's like wrapping something in a thin coating of bubble wrap and then flinging it across the room and being surprised that it broke. I am sad that this was his journey. I am sad that his children will always regret gambling on our government system. And I am damn angry that we continue to leave the fate of our hands in the incompetence of our Prime Minister. He who spends three weeks at home with COVID and then has the audacity to arrogantly lecture and berate the rest of us who put him in power. COVID is real, far too real to me and many around the world. But one year later, sitting with our fingers crossed, hoping we get away is not a strategy. Neither is a useless curfew that does not address movement. Maybe spending a fraction of the economic impact on these shutdowns in securing vaccines might have been a better idea. This is not a political post. This is an indictment on both of the opposition and the leading body. This is an indictment on every single person directly and indirectly serving the government. 
So do not respond assuming I am anti-PNM. I am anti-senseless death due to inaction when you had a long head start. Heaven stole our angel. Rest in peace. You may be their stupid statistics, but to us, you were our loving nan that's gone forever. We love you always and will miss you forever. This is not a UNC person. They say, they're saying this is the reality. They are against senseless death. And I agree with the, the, the writer of this, that over a year, and we have not put systems in place to save lives. Far less save livelihoods. We are already not saving lives. We are killing livelihoods even before COVID. And here we are, this indictment from a person who is obviously neither UNC nor PM, but a person who is a citizen and patriot, telling their story, which is a heartbreaking story. And therefore, I raise the concern. Medical care, what is happening? Are you really categorizing people in this way, old and have the preconditions and so on? Is that what you're doing prioritizing who will live and who will die? Is it that some people are now seeing themselves as God? That they determine whom they will take care of and the ones they'll shunt aside and put aside and not take care of? That's the story of this person that I read to you. So as I move on onto another topic, I look at now at um, relief applications because we're in a hard time. So the minister is boasting you can get relief. And the Prime Minister is telling the country 25,000 hampers will be given out. But apparently the Ministry of Social Development and the Ministry of Agriculture, who, was, who were the agencies or agents for the distribution of the hampers to the MPs' offices, Prime Minister said 25,000 hampers. That works out to about 600 hampers per constituency at 41 constituencies. But as I say, these two ministries who were administering that relief program, they were closing their fridge door. They were closing their fridge door so they didn't hear the Prime Minister say 25,000 hampers. Because on the very day while these announcements are being made, the MPs officers are saying, listen, we can't give you 600 hampers. So before they even give it, they take it back away. They reduce the numbers. So relief, you talk about it, sounds good on paper, you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. It sounds good that you're going to be giving these grants to people, you relief grants, but you know, since last year people applied, they have not received it yet. Dave Tanku, MP Tanku, yesterday at a press briefing talked about over 7,000 people who had applied, who qualified, but couldn't get it. You know why? Because they didn't have a bank account. Did not have a bank account. Do you know what pressure it is now to set up a bank account? How much paper you had to carry to set up a bank account. So the most vulnerable, the poorest, will not have the bank accounts, and they need it the most. So that was last year, people 7,000 fell off. And you know, up to now, one year later, they still haven't done anything to make, make sure that these 7,000 who had qualified didn't have a bank account, that something would be done. But they're doing the same thing again, announcing all these relief measures, and again, if these people have no bank accounts, how are you going to give them the money? What are you going to do? You cannot pelt your hands up in the air, throw, and say, listen, they have no bank account, no money. They need it the most. So whilst on paper it sounds good, Minister of Finance and Prime Minister, and we'll give you relief grant, salary grant, and this grant and that grant, the ones who need it the most, it will not reach them. What will you do? What will you change? How will you change your modus operandi to make sure that those most in need will get it? And then what have you done now? You have said we will put the application forms for the relief grants, they'll be out. That was supposed to be Monday. Monday come and go on. As far as I know, those forms did not go up online all of last week. I don't know if they're up today, this Monday. But they were not online. That's just one issue. The second issue related to this year is they've made all these applications to be done online. Online. People have enough difficulty as it is. They will welcome these grants. We, as I tell you, we are inundated with calls and so on with people wanting help. But they don't care. So you put it down online. Already we have thousands of people, no internet access. How are they going online? Thousands of people with no devices. We know it with the children. 
far less for the parents. How will they go online to apply for these things? Oh, you say, well, go down in the internet cafe somewhere. But those are places of work. You shut them down. So how are these persons who I think needed most, how are they going to fill up your forms? Once again, you know, it's typical. Typical. The poor never matter. P and M. People never matter. P and M. Have you thought these things through? So it sounds good when you hold your press conference. We're going to give you this. We're giving you that. So many people getting. And yet, you know, how do you access it online? How many can access the form online? You know, there are serious um, in the jurisprudence, in the law, there are many, many cases which talk about giving somebody something. But then it's how do you access it? And if you cannot access it, if you do not have the means and so on, that is, it, 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 that is a, a, a violation of your rights. So, for example, you have cases where they're saying um, you are entitled to get a particular license. We had to pay a license fee. Some cases have said, no, 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 you can't put a money figure on it. And I'm thinking those cases would apply here where you're saying, you could apply, you will get it. But go online. You have no device. You have no internet. Are you for real? Is this government for real? Do they have a care at all for those most in need? So those relief applications, a lot more could be said. Um, MP Tanko, as I um, indicated before, has some very important points to talk about. Over $11 billion spent, over 18, 11 billion received from various agencies to spend on COVID. Over 18 billion spent, and we still don't know where. Again, I mentioned, and I repeat, the call for an audit of the expenditure on COVID. So these were some of the issues I wanted to um, raise with you this evening. And I have received a letter on another note from the Trinidad Muslim League. And I will quote from that letter. It is with a great sense of sadness that we are witnessing the immense hardship facing the people of Palestine. To date, as reported by the international media, over 200 Palestinians, including children, have been killed, and nine Israelis have been killed. The army of Israel has bombarded the people of Palestine, destroying lives and infrastructure. Both sides have lost lives, however. The Palestinians have overwhelmingly suffered the greatest hardship, death of its people, loss of land, homes, and other resources. I continue to read from the letter. On September 13, 1993, Israeli Prime Minister and Palestinian Liberation Organization negotiator signed a declaration of principles on interim self-government arrangements commonly referred to as the Oslo Accord, giving rise to the two-state agreement, Palestine and Israel. Both states live side by side and have an international recognition and sovereignty. To date, the provisions of the agreement have not been realized. The letter continues. I leave out parts of it in the interest of time. I quote again, we fully understand the complex nature of the conflict and the difficult road ahead in bringing this international humanity suffering under some kind of control whereby both people can live side by side. As constituents of Trinidad and Tobago, this is the Trinidad Muslim League, I'm quoting it from their letter, as constituents of Trinidad and Tobago, we are seeking a bipartisan approach and they, there be a call for an immediate end to the current onslaught on the Palestinian population by the Israeli army, as well as the termination of the rocket fire from the Palestinian controlled region. I continue. We are seeking your public disapproval of the current situation in Palestine and the immediate cessation of the bombing of the people of Palestine and the rocket fire from Gaza. A return to the Oslo Accord and implementation of the different UN declarations by all parties, both Israel and Palestine. Lives of Palestinians and Israelis must be saved and protected, and there must be equality of treatment and adherence to all resolutions and legal agreements. I think this is a very, very fair stance on the part of the Trinidad Muslim League, um, adopted by the TML, and I support it. I support the stance of the Trinidad Muslim League in this matter. 
I support them in their call for equality of treatment and adherence to all resolutions and legal agreements, including the Oslo Accord, including the UN declarations in this regard. It is, um, again, a case of humanity and suffering. So I offer this and I make the call, and I call on government as well, that they should also have give consideration to what is happening there. It is a case of humanity and the suffering of men, women, and children. I move along now. I want to talk about some initiatives that the UNC would undertake, given the hardship that our people are suffering, all the people of our land are suffering. And we did it before. In the last lockdown, we were out there, our councils, our activists, our MBs, we were out there, packing hampers right here. I remember we had like a factory line, packing up hampers and giving out. We've done it before for COVID. We've done it before in other natural disasters, especially in terms of flooding and so on. So the lockdowns we're experiencing at a time when the rest of the world is opening back up is not affecting us. The lockdown is not affecting us equally. If you do not have water, you don't have electricity, you don't have enough space at home to socially distance, then you can't follow in truth fully the health regulations. If you can't work from home, and you earn your living doing housework or garden work or daily pay jobs. You don't have a bank account. I talked about it before. You don't have, then you have no income and government will not give you the income relief. So I'm saying you can't feed your family. So the lockdown is not affecting us in the same manner. The most vulnerable are the ones suffering the most. If you look at the news headlines around the world, they read, lockdowns are fine for the rich, but millions are too poor to shelter from coronavirus. Another headline. Wealth increase of 10 men during pandemic could buy vaccines for all. Another headline. How the rich partied during coronavirus lockdown. Another headline. Zoom privilege. How lockdowns made the rich richer. Another headline. COVID has worsened inequality even as the rich thrive. An even more divided world, COVID is a boon for the rich, a bane for the poor. As millions of people around the world lost jobs, billionaires increased their wealth by 27.5% between April and July. These are the headlines, these are news stories. So it's, I'm not making this up, it's out there in the public domain. And so we see here we are facing a similar kind of situation because of the recklessness and heartlessness of the government we have. So just as we did during the first lockdown, Last year, just as we did natural disasters like flooding, we are going to organize relief efforts throughout the entire country. The UNC will organize relief efforts throughout the country. We will help those who cannot afford even their basic needs at this time. And we are asking those of you in the wider population to respond to the very real threat of food insecurity, which thousands of our citizens are facing each day during this pandemic. And so you can contribute to this initiative, and I call upon you, those of you who can, those of you who are able to contribute. You can contribute with foodstuffs, household supplies, and you can also volunteer to give logistical, physical uh, assistance. And so I want to launch this initiative tonight under the banner, the UNC is here to help, the UNC is here to care. We do have a video message, and um, can we play the video message at this time, or you want to do it? As COVID-19 continues to ravage our economy, the number of people who are struggling is expected to rise significantly. The United National Congress is here to help those who can't afford to meet even their basic needs. We're asking you to respond to the very real threat of it that thousands of our citizens are facing each day during this pandemic. You can contribute to this initiative with foodstuff, household supplies, or you could even volunteer logistic assistance. Call Yusha at 384-2212 or Karen at 636-8145. They're standing by to take your call now. Indicate your location for pickup and we'll be there. Or the United National Congress, care to help, care to care. So we have this initi initiative, UNC is here to help, UNC is here to care. I call upon right thinking citizens who can, afford, uh, who can afford it to help contribute foodstuffs, help contribute 
household appliances and help contribute of your time and your labor in any way which you can. So that is one initiative, initiative which the UNC will pursue in these very, very hard times. Before I close, I want to make some suggestions. I made some last day and I will continue with those. The USA has announced, and I mentioned it before, but I want to repeat this. President Biden has announced 20 million more vaccines that he's going to give away. I am calling on the USA to provide some of those vaccinations to Trinidad and Tobago, those vaccines to Trinidad and Tobago. I am calling on the USA to donate some of those vaccines to Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm calling on government to pursue such a donation. Don't be ashamed to beg to save lives, Prime Minister. That is not begging, that is humanitarian on your part to help the people of Trinidad and Tobago. A second suggestion, I know we talked about the field hospitals, all well and good. But should the system continue to be overburdened, should we run out of space? Then there are a lot of buildings that we have. The UNC built over 100 schools, 106 schools. We built them, they're there, they're empty. And it, if it is that you need spaces, you can convert, retrofit in some way, these existing buildings should the need arise. So the use of some of our schools, certainly, in these very difficult times. A further suggestion, I made it, I may repeat it, of VAT refunds, Minister of Finance, Prime Minister Rowley, those VAT payments do not belong to you. They, you're using it like it's your money, it's not your money. Give the businesses their VAT refunds. They need those VAT refunds, especially now when their profits, their income is drained, is down. Suggestion, pay people their VAT refunds. Another suggestion is to remove the VAT on all food items. You know, I know Mr. Embert said he doesn't want to deal with taxes and taking away taxes, but Minister, look at your revenue streams from VAT. When you came into office, you, you removed all these items off the, the list that we had placed as VAT exempt. When I say removed, you put them back on for VAT on the 7,000 food items. The majority of the 7,000 food items, you put back VAT on it. And you, you fool people by saying, hey, we're reducing it now. It's not 15%, but it's 12%. But in this time, you had already increased the number of items that people had to pay fat on. Your revenue stream will not fall by very much by putting back these almost 7,000 items as fat exempt items, food items. If you look at the revenue streams on the VAT, you will see when you put them back on, you didn't get much more revenue from the VAT, you know. You did not get, it did not increase your revenue stream by any big amount, so they, it's not going to hurt you by removing them, the food items, off the list. People are suffering. And one basic essential, which is well recognized in all your regulations, is to keep places dealing with food, selling food and supplying food. You've kept them open because people, are, you understand, that's a basic need. Basic need, food. So, remove the vat of food items, Mr. Prime Minister. Remove them, allow people to breathe. Let people breathe more freely, at least food will become more affordable for them and for their families. And I close now by saying, I've made the suggestions as I said, and um, I close by imploring each and every one of you to follow the health protocols. Sanitize, wash your hands, social distance. Get tested. And again, we have an issue here because not sufficient testing. And I'm told that private institutions are charging up to $1,500 for a test. So government also needs to ramp up. And we've been talking about that from day one. Test, 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 test. Get tested. And get vaccinated. Check your doctor. Get vaccinated. Follow the health protocols. Sanitize. Wash your hands. Social distance. Stay at home as far as possible. Get tested and get vaccinated. I thank you all very much. We shall meet again. You know, and as I close, I'm reminded, I was just going to wrap up here now, but I really, can you imagine a Prime Minister 
Every time he speaks, he blames everybody else, but yet he got the COVID too. Who is he blaming for himself getting COVID? He seems to blame the people who contract the COVID, but this is an airborne disease. It's not your fault if you contract it, but you blame everyone else. And on top of that, the language is so obscene. You think it's a joke. It says a Calypso, you quote a promise. You're not a Calypsonian. You're a leader, you're a prime minister. How can you use that obscene language in the public domain? Is that the kind of language you will teach your children? Do you want our children to listen to when you, when you speak, when you have to use language? You quote from a Calypso so that uh, you have Calypsonian license, you have poetic license. No, no, no. You are not a Calypsonian. As much as you may want to kick off and kick off and become one, you are not. Do your job. You're the prime minister of the country, and we are very disappointed in you. I thank you all very much. Keep safe. Follow all the health protocols. God bless you. Thank you very much. That you have people out of the country who cannot come home. They cannot come. They're stateless. Finally, the Express is being fair and printing the truth. We should be having trials starting and finishing in 120 days. What have you done to protect women and girls? It must tell us that something is wrong. This is Ali Baba and 40 Thieves in charge of Trinidad and Tobago today.